probably would have been about 1970, uh, between my freshman and sophomore years in high school, I found myself in a hospital bed there in Flint, Michigan, where I uh, grew up. It had been uh, a I guess you could say a bad year. Uh, <clears throat> I, back then, when you were 15, you took driver's training, right? And, and that's what I was doing, and really looking forward to getting my driver's license. And maybe it was about halfway through driver's training when my parents informed me that uh, I would not be finishing because I would be going to summer school. And you see, uh, your pastor had got, I shouldn't be saying this, probably in front of the kids, but I got four Fs, uh, first course on course in, in uh, English, and I got four Fs in Bible class. Yes, I did. Now, um, I went to Roman Catholic schools from the kindergarten through the 12th grade. And so there it was that I uh, got my Fs. So what my parents could not know uh, and never did know was that um, so earlier uh, that summer, um, there had been a fight. I had been in a fight. Me and my friends were kind of, you know, just roaming the streets and ran into a guy that I actually knew. Uh, I guess he was my friend in a sense, but I had been drinking he had been drinking, and there was a fight, and this person, right, this boy, uh, ended up in the hospital, and um, <clears throat> I got a phone call the next day from one of my friends letting me know that, well, you see, this, this guy attended uh, was... Uh, the toughest school in the city of Flint, which was saying something. I attended uh, the Roman Catholic schools. We actually, um, at the end of my ninth grade, all the smaller Catholic schools in the city of Flint closed, and they opened a beautiful, you know, Class A school, beautiful school, and that's where I would attend in the 10th grade. But as I was saying, this boy... Uh, I mean, he was a member of a gang, and um, I was put on notice that, you know, I was number one enemy of that gang. Now, me, if I, you know, did get in a fight, uh, it would be with fists, you know. And But, but these guys were, would use, you know, brass knuckles and chains and knives and so on and so forth. Well, it should come as no surprise that uh, these guys were all at summer school. Apparently, they got a few Fs also, you know. And I mean, uh, like even before this time, my friends would tell me, man, you know, there was three carloads of guys through here last night looking for you. I mean, I lived for you know, a couple years. I had to wash my back, trust me. I mean, they... And so here I went to summer school, and here they were. Yeah, here they were. And they came to my, the, my room, like, first day of school. They weren't there to improve their grades. And this is just details, but I also had been involved uh, from a young age in the 
summer wrestling program that they had in the city of Flint. And, and uh, pretty much always in these tournaments, I would always end up in the championship match. And uh, there was, I pretty much was always the same guy because we were seated, if you know what that means. But anyway, and not pretty much, but every time this guy beat me <laughs> and fairly easily. But we were friends. And uh, fortunately for me, he was in summer school. And I don't know what he said to these guys. And I, you know, I, I didn't follow him during the school year. Uh, and so I, I have no idea what his caliber was. But whatever it was, these guys were afraid of him and they backed off. So that was until the second to last day of school when again they were out at the door of my, my uh, classroom in which uh, I told the teacher that there's 10 guys out there and I am going to exit out the window. <laughs> and that is exactly what I did. I exited out the window. Uh, fortunately, it was on the ground floor. But, and I did not attend school the last day of school. That was it. And um, uh, so I never had to face those guys. Now, um, but I was, I should be ashamed to say, uh, bitter toward my parents that entire summer. You know, uh, no driver's training, and then, you know, my life was at stake at summer school as if they had gotten the, the Fs, you understand. Uh, I can say that I had not spoken to my father uh, for many weeks. And um, as I lay there in that hospital bed, uh, preparing for surgery. I uh, had a hernia, found out it because I was going out for football. And uh, anyway, at quite a surprise, my father came in my room. He normally would have been working. He came in the mid-morning and um, you know, he, was a, <laughs> he was a person of very few words, which uh, I mean, I, I I had a very good father, but uh, it was a problem to some of my siblings, at least. But, you know, we made our peace there. And uh, he had taken the whole day off, and he had gone out to play golf, and about 8 o'clock or something that evening, I don't know what time it was, but my oldest brother came into my room, um, and informed me that my dad had had a heart attack. Um, and uh, <clears throat> he took me up, up to, in the, he was in the same hospital I was in. He was in intensive care, and they took me up to see him, and he was, uh, you know, all hooked up, with tubes every which way, and I could see he was really, really fighting there. And... Uh, and uh, he died that evening. My father died that evening. Uh, actually, as I recall now, I, I had already had surgery. I was just in, in uh, it had been several days, but um, so I went home uh, that, that day, that next day. Anyway, uh, I was already at a, well, really, when I was probably fifth grade, I was an altar boy, you know, an altar boy, and had me and my my friend. We um, quickly realized that the wine was stored in the back of the altar, and um, that's really where I first started drinking, um, and then. Uh, you know, by the time I was seventh, eighth grade, I was drinking, you know, buying, I couldn't take only so much wine from the church. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, 
in the city of Flint, what you would do is you'd find people who were old enough to buy for you, and, and they would. Sometimes you'd be related to those people. But anyway, um, and then very quickly came in, you know, the marijuana, and, <clears throat> and by the time I was in 10th grade, so now post my father's death, uh, <clears throat> I was taking, you know, a lot of, I mean, I was smoking dope, I was drinking, uh, taking a lot of pills, of lots of different kinds. And <clears throat> this was, uh, especially in 11th grade, this really, really came to a peak. And uh, um, but by the grace of God, I graduated uh, from that fine school and actually went on uh, to college. <clears throat> where I was a heavy drinker. I mean, a daily drinker. But I could, I could pass. No more Fs. Uh, so it was that one weekend, I drove back up to, so I, was, I went to Eastern Michigan University at that time, and I drove the hour up to, up to Flint, and there I met some of my high school buddies, and we bought... Uh, some things in terms of you know drugs and we our plan was and we did drive up to up north to where one of my friends parents had a cottage so we uh you know had bought some marijuana and we had ended up buying some pills from this guy and i remember the kid earnestly warned us you know just take one of these and we thought we laughed because he was younger than us so we laughed and we we took two of them and uh so we made it up to the cottage, and we um, sat around and smoked dope and drank and played cards. And so it went. And then somebody got the idea, we should go to the bar. Well, let's go to the bar. And so um, I was driving, which is a horrible thing. But uh, we, we made it. And... Um, and um, we went, you know, we were, we were in the city of Gladwin. And, you know, we were from Flint. And we thought anything pretty much north of Flint was the sticks, you know. <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we thought. And, you know, we were sure there'd be nobody in this, this bar that we would go to. And we were not aware, I wasn't aware that it was, you know, hunting season, deer hunting season. And the place was packed. And then, in fact, there was a band there, of course, a rock band. And we went in, and at that time, you only had to be 18 to drink in the state of Michigan. Uh, they tried that for a while, and then they moved it back. But I happened to be uh, a senior in high school when they did that, uh, the last part of my year. And um, it made for some interesting situations. But anyway... So we were served, um, but you know, the Spirit of God had been speaking to me, even, even the latter part of my senior year of high school. I remember that the last 30 days, the last 30 days of school, I, I decided that I was not going to smoke dope, okay? Of course, I was still drinking, and et cetera, but I, this was the Spirit of God working in my heart, and I, I remember actually asking myself, um, who is God? You know, what, who is the true God? Is it Jesus? Is it Buddha? Who I knew not a thing about. But um, I also remember um, I used to play, well, <laughs> I had a girlfriend who lived across from the first green at the local golf course, and so it was quite a bit cheaper to uh, tee off from her front yard than it was from the, other from the beginning. Anyway, but I can remember uh, that being out there and, wow, you know, those trees are beautiful. And, and the Spirit of God was speaking to me. So there I was. And I was, you know, out of my mind, but I was sitting there thinking about, well, one of the things that happened was 
as I looked around me, um, in this you know full place, it's it just seemed to me that some of these ladies who were with um, some of these men that it, that it was not their husbands, and and um, you know I. I just thought to myself, just as I looked at the whole scene, just put it that way, I looked at the whole scene there. And I wasn't particularly unhappy with the way I was living. I really wasn't, but the thought hit me. You know, I used because most of these people there were, you know, older than I was. And are you still going to be living like this 10 years from now like these people are? Like I said, I wasn't particularly unhappy, but I knew there was something more. There had to be something more. And frankly, I was hungry for spiritual truth. And so, as I sat there, the band played a song. Uh, it was called Knocking on Heaven's Door. Okay? Uh, now, you won't, you won't, it's not in our hymnal. <laughs> uh, and it never will be in our hymnal. But I was quite familiar with it. And of course, the chorus was, wait a minute, how come you people are laughing? You guys know this song? <laughs> <laughs> Knocking on heaven's door, that was a chorus. And just that chorus made me think about more, even more about spiritual reality. In fact, I, when I stood right in front of this band and I asked them, I mean, I asked myself, excuse me, um, I was asking myself again. And, and I stood right in front of the, the band as if, you know, just listening to this song, this, you know, this rock group, this rock band, listening to this song, hoping I might get some spiritual something from it. And the song finished. There was people dancing, you know, all around me. And when the song finished, for whatever reason, I just turned and went directly into the bathroom, this, you know, smoke-filled bar. And there I stood in the bathroom, and I prayed to God, whoever you are, please reveal yourself to me. Uh, I even said that, uh, well, please reveal yourself to me. And, and to my amazement, I felt there the presence of God. I felt the presence of God. But I really, you know, didn't know what to do. Um, and then somebody came in the bathroom, and I couldn't really just stand there praying in the bathroom of this bar. And so I went back out, and it's just crazy, but I ended up getting a conversation with the bartender, uh, you know, after this experience in the bathroom, and I, well, we got kicked out. We were told to get out. <laughs> I won't go into the details on that, but, and so, you know, we did, and now among my friends, there was four of us, so it's not like we had to say, well, what do you guys want to do next? We all knew what we wanted to do next. We wanted to find another bar before closing time, you know, so we could drink some more. There was no question about that. And so we just, I, we just drove as fast as we could to, okay, and I, I pulled in, got out, we went in, sat down, and the waitress came. She looked at our identifications. Um, Everything was good, and so she served us. But I was looking around there, and I quickly realized that this was not of the same caliber as the last place. This was, maybe it was more of a nice, fine restaurant where they served, you know, alcohol. Uh, and, you know, like I'm sure we were all wearing, you know, the blue jean jacket and... Um, not that it matters one bit, but 
kind of mattered maybe a little bit back then, but, you know, of course, my shoulder length hair. and I used to wear this velvet hat, rimmed hat. Uh, and people were looking at us, okay? Like, well, this is not the clientele that they were used to. And, and I saw they were looking at us, but, hey, I didn't care. We were legal. We were there. And I was thinking about spiritual realities. And as I did so, the waitress came back. She asked to please see our driver's licenses again. And I thought, well, that's strange. She's already seen them once. But we gave them to her. And, but I watched her. Uh, and I watched as she and the owner, manager, whatever he was, got into an argument, clearly, and she got her coat, and she left. Well, I thought to myself, you know, this guy, you know, doesn't want us here because, we, you know, we have long hair or whatever, and he didn't believe her that we were legal here, and so she got upset, and she left. And I thought to myself, um, should be a fairly logical thought, I think. Uh, I thought to myself, I'm going to go up there and break this guy's jaw. That's, that's what I thought. And so I stood up and I began walking toward him. And I have no idea if he was watching me or not, but what I know is that it came to me from heaven, I think, the thought in any case, the thought came to me. You know, Jesus said, walk while you have the light, lest darkness comes upon you. And the thought came to me that, you know, God, God heard your prayer. And you know, I didn't know that much about God. I told you I got four Fs when I was a freshman. And... Um, now, in my defense, I had a nun teaching that class. She was, a, we figured, at least 110 years old. And uh, it just wasn't very interesting, okay? But, I, you know, I, I didn't know very much, but I, I believed, just as much probably from Woodstock as from any other source, but I believed that God was a God of love. I believed that the God of this universe was a God of love, and that's what I believed, and and I was pretty sure that a God of love did not want me to come up here and, you know, punch this guy. And, and so I said, I, I prayed, okay, God, no matter what this guy, you know, I, I needed to get our licenses back. I said, no matter what this guy says or does to me, I said, I'm going to love this guy. I surrendered my heart to that thought. And when I did so, I felt a load of guilt fall off my shoulders. I had no clue that I was carrying, but I was virtual. That really wasn't my concern. I didn't really realize that I was carrying this burden of guilt until it came off. My concern was the power to change my life. And I immediately sensed that I have received a power by which I can change my life. But more than that, I sensed the presence of the living Jesus. I mean, the living Jesus. Uh, I sensed his off, just unspeakable presence to be, was right there, living in that bar. And it was so... There's no words, really. It was awesome. And I don't know how long this took place in a matter of 
seconds or something like this. And I found myself, so I walked to the bartender who was there waiting for me. And I literally, by this point, I literally felt that if I did not speak, my very heart would burst. And I told him what was so real to me. Jesus is alive. He loves us. Yes, that's right. That's not what he's expecting to hear from me. But that's what I told him. Jesus is alive. And I, I had never been so earnest in my life. The living Jesus. And there was a couple guys at the actual, you know, bar of the bar where they have... <laughs> And there was a couple guys up there, and they were clearly intoxicated, which all of a sudden was repulsive to me. Um, and they were arguing, and I told, went to them, and I told them, you know, Jesus is alive. He loves us. And then I realized that everybody in the whole place was looking at me. And so... I preached my first sermon. I mean, there was probably, I'm going to say 50 people there, uh, maybe more. And uh, I turned to them and I, I said, Jesus is alive. He's alive. He loves us. Well, I never had had any training or anything, and I didn't know that I was... Well, it didn't come out the way I meant it. I said, He loves us. I said, even if we are drunks, even if we are drunks, He loves us. Well, I don't know what you folks would do if I called you a bunch of drunks. I, but what they did is if, a, is, is if a button, somebody pressed a button and they all just came at me. All the men in that bar just came at me, literally. And they were not there to congratulate me on my conversion. <laughs> uh, I will congratulate at this point in time the bartender who handled the whole situation so beautifully for he stepped between me and them. Uh, one gentleman actually took a swing at me. My friends by this time were pulling me out. And... Um, I had never been as sober as I was that moment in my life. And I, out there, I met the waitress, uh, and I told her, Jesus, he's alive. He loves us. And uh, we got in the car. We went back to the cottage. Nobody said a word. You could hear a pin drop. Let me tell you, at that age, the Spirit of God is speaking to every one of those, my friend's heart. Nobody said a word. I went home. I went to bed. I mean, it was, you know, well after midnight. And one of my friends actually took my car, went out and bought some more beer. But I went to bed. I woke up the next morning. I had peace that passes understanding, peace that I'd never experienced before. I went out in the woods. Um, and I, 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 I was rejoicing, but, but I also cried. Uh, you know, things I had done, uh, especially thinking of my mother and things I'd put her through. So I had joy and I had sorrow. And I don't know how long I was out there, but my friends came out there. Pastor Dan, yeah, I know, not Pastor Dan, sorry. <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> you know, they want to know if I was all right. You know, I said, well, I've never been better in my life. Well, you know, you've been out here a long time. Okay, all right. So we were going to go home that day, and so we did. And, and uh, I began to the people who were closest to me, uh, I began to talk about Jesus. Uh, now, um, you know, 
I left that bar that night. I never drank again. I never smoked dope again. I never took drugs again. A number of other things. Um, I had been trying to quit smoking for like two years or something. My poor friend. I'd always be borrowing cigarettes from him, you know, <laughs> because I was trying to quit. Uh, I didn't quit that night. I quit maybe 10 days later because I wasn't sure. Nobody told me, you know, about that or whatever. But I decided about 10 days later that I was going to quit smoking cigarettes. And by the power of Jesus, I did so. No problem at all. So um, I was new creation. Okay. And um, by the way, I had the privilege of going into my the large Catholic high school and sharing. Uh, well, I mean, people were, started calling me because the word was out, you know, this drug dealer, you know. Um, and I was, had lots of opportunity to tell people about the living Jesus. And um, I was, had the privilege of going into my high school and telling them about the living Jesus, giving them a Bible study. And uh, I'm so thankful I, uh, I've had, though I have failed him and continue to fail him, I've had the living Jesus by my side for these decades. And this is our privilege, every one of us. And uh, this is our purpose as a church family. This is our purpose to share the living Jesus. Amen.